No. Uh, hey, how much more time do we have before we take off? Uh, oh, I see where that is. We have about... This is coming from the lounge. Yeah. Seven minutes. Is there something you want to set up to do? Yeah, I'd love to get one push core from the top here before we go. It doesn't have to be in... Just straight up sediment is fine. Okay. Yep. Uh, Pick a spot, any spot. Sounds good. Hey, Steve, I'm getting a call from uh, the lounge, and they would like a push core on yeah, the top. Yeah, I, I heard them. Okay, just making sure. I wasn't sure if that was on which channel. Yeah, we can get a push core. Thanks, that'd be awesome. I think anywhere we th think is probably going to get a good depth. This, po this pocket seems to look okay. No? Sure, give it a go. Um. There's some small animals sticking out of the sediment. I'm not sure what those are. It might, might be sea pens. All right, I think we're going to get ready to uh, watch change, but um, yeah, like up we'll have now. the opportunity to do a push core. I don't know we're going to get much of a core, but we can maybe hop up. Blue like water. Right in, well, Sorry, I'm just core. hearing a lot of things right now. Uh, okay. Say again? Don't worry about it. It's all good. Okay. We are setting you up for push core.
Hello, hello. We are in our final hours of the fifth dive of the uh, AI Hiki K. Push core two. Could you uh, not do push core two? Could you do it from the back? Roger, going for the green one. Thanks. No Kai expedition. Confirming There's the green one? <laughs> Confirming that's the back one, right? Yep. Okay, yep. Thanks. We are apparently doing a push core, so I shall remain quiet while they do that.
If this attempt doesn't work, let's go ahead and come up afterwards. Roger. going to interrupt to explain. Yep, we're being quiet for the uh, ROV pilots as they take a push core sample. Okay, science. So, yeah, no push core. Um, we'll begin ready to come up. ROV off bottom. Okay, so we are wrapping up our fifth dive of the Lu'ua Ai Hiki K Kualanukai expedition. We just finished up surveying around unnamed Seamount B. We are headed up to the surface. Collected several uh, biological and geological samples. So welcome to the very last blue water watch. We took you down. We're bringing you back up one final time. Because you know what they say, what goes down must come up. This is your watch lead, Megan Putt speaking. The University of Hawaii. Go ahead, Bridge. The rest of us in the back row are... Avery and Carrington, your science communication fellow for this watch, and a professional illustrator and cartographer. Farley Rodriguez, Data. Trevor Herc. Antonella Argus. Um, I'm Aaron Rainey. I'm on video engineer. Aaron Heffron, navigator, mapper. All right, here it is, the blue water. 
going to be an exciting watch. By exciting, I mean all the same color. Our favorite color. But don't worry, there'll be things in the midwater to see. Question in the chat, is this the last time of the expedition and when does the next one start? Um, so I don't actually know. Um, we will find out. We are definitely wrapping up the, uh, the, <laughs> we are definitely wrapping up uh, the end of the expedition. Um, there may be another dive, but um, I'm not positive what's going to uh, go down. Um, the next expedition starts in January. I don't know about January. I think oh, I would keep being told January. Okay. Then February? <laughs> you would know better than I would. As far as I know, January is mobilization. February is shakedown. Okay. Um, but maybe I don't know either. <laughs> Mid-February is right. Mid February? Okay. Mid -February. Everybody keeps telling me January. So I'm like, okay. The lounge is piped in with mid-February. All right. Thanks. And we will have another dive. We're gonna we're planning to do a Argus only dive at midnight with just the very few short hours we have to go. We've got to uh, start our 24 hour transit at 5 a.m. local. Roger, thanks, Allison. Was that over SPL? Did you guys hear that? Yep. No. Okay, great. So how much water do you guys think is here? A lot. <laughs> More than 10 gallons, less than infinity. <laughs> oh, you beat me to it. <laughs> A uh, question, have there been any invasive deep sea critters found during this expedition that we know of? I'm going to go with no. We haven't uh, identified any invasive species in the deep sea on this expedition. How would you know? That is a good question. I don't know how <laughs> we know because we've never been to this part of the ocean before. True, so we don't know what belongs here and what doesn't. And 
and how would they get here? Normally, invasive species are transported from one location to another, um, usually by humans, uh, or, so, or somehow influenced by humans to bring those species. Um, so it would just be very difficult for an, an invasive species to get from one place from another place. One, play, one way it could possibly happen, which would be near impossible, would be to have an ROV go down, say, in the Atlantic, pick up some sort of stray organism, and then bring it over to the Pacific. But by the time an ROV made that trip, the organism would be long dead. And also, we always wash down the vehicles after every dive and the vehicles sit on deck in the sun. So it's just, uh, it would be very difficult. It wouldn't be like transporting a bushel of bananas across state lines or from, you know, South America to somewhere else tropical where uh, maybe a species of spider might thrive. Uh, it's just not as feasible with the deep sea. Not that it's not impossible, but we know so little about our deep oceans that invasive species is something that we don't have the capacity yet to measure. Unfortunately, now I just have an image of like sentient bananas, like running around like an invasive species, just like, you know, you're walking, bananas. You know, you're like walking down the street and there's just like, you know, bananas running around disrupting the wildlife. Yeah. Well, you know. A lot of invasive animal or invasive species are plants. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I, I don't know. That was just somehow I wasn't thinking banana plants. I was just yeah. thinking <laughs> well, bananas like, running Well, a lot wild. of times produce will bring in animals. Yeah. Um, that's how a lot of the invasive species got to Hawaii is things brought in by people um, accidentally with shipments. Uh, I've got a question. Does the salinity of water change at different depths? I feel like only a hint, but I'm not. Um, yes, it does. To ask, does it? I know it changes, but I don't know if it's like a drastic change or like. Well, you can actually check out the graph of it on our Grafana app. You check out the science data. It'll show you how the salinity changes with depth as That's we make true. our ascent, and the salinity will change as we go through different water masses on our way from the deep to the shallow. Yeah, it's not like a huge, huge... Yeah, you're not seeing yeah. like tons of change. Um, it's not like it's going to go from being nearly fresh water to being extremely salty. But say Antarctic bottom water is a lot saltier than you might see at the surface. <laughs> what is my favorite ABBA song that represents ocean voyages? Hang on, let me look into the vault. Gotta, I gotta marinate on that one. Is there a chance that the mounts visited on the same dive might get new critters distributed by Hercules? Isn't one of the things that you guys are interested in, like, uh, about, like, how species, you know, like how the population changes from seamount to seamount in a chain? Yeah, that is something we're interested in looking at. And so um, we believe that there's connectivity between seamounts, especially seamounts in a chain. Uh, and looking at the communities uh, from seamount to seamount will give us a little bit of a sense of how these communities are connected or possibly disconnected from one another. Uh, Ways that we can measure that is by uh, identifying the animals that we're seeing on the seamounts at different depths and comparing them across seamounts adjacent to each other uh, along the chain. So uh, seamounts closer to each I other didn't, didn't even would theoretically be <laughs> more similar in community structure uh, in comparison to seamounts that are further away.
Uh, <laughs> were there any discoveries made during this expedition or previous ones that made you question everything you've learned in your field of expertise? I only laughed at that because the first thing that popped in my mind uh, was our uh, new uh, seahorse fact. And I'm, <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with my field of expertise, but it did like shake my core. Yeah. So we found out that sea fish neither have teeth nor stomachs, which seems like a thing that everybody should like. That should be a basic sea fact, but... Yeah, I had no know idea. this about seahorses. <laughs> and then I realized that I really know nothing about seahorses. <laughs> yeah. And maybe I should know things about seahorses. But in general, the animals that I know very little about, that I get asked questions about all the time, are whales, dolphins, sharks, and shallow water coral. Which are not your expertise, correct? No, those are not my expertise. I do make an effort to try to learn some facts to share about those animals because I do get questions so often. Megan, what sparked your interest in deep sea? Like, what was your path to getting into deep sea? So, uh, I was always really interested in invertebrates. So, before I found my passion in marine science, I, I really liked entomology, so studying bugs. Uh, but then uh, I saw some tide pools and just really got fascinated with all the different variety of marine invertebrates there were. Uh, and it wasn't until I was in my undergrad that I discovered the deep sea and ocean exploration and was interested in following a career path looking at the deep ocean. However, uh, I ended up taking a job doing marine and freshwater taxonomy for a while. And I had even more time to think about what type of work I wanted to do for uh, my grad school experience. And that's when I started looking into deep sea coral and sponge research. And that's how I ended up in Hawaii, because there was a project um, in Sam, you know, Sam, Con Dr. Sam Kong's lab, uh, he had a few Pisces dives uh, surveying lava flows off the big island of Hawaii. And I was able to look at those dives, uh, annotate the corals that we saw on the different lava flows, and use that data to try to understand how the community might change and develop over time based on the ages of the lava flows that were surveyed. So we know that deep water corals grow very, very slowly. They have very long lives. And that leads us to believe that it would take a very long time to recover from a disturbance event, like say trawling or a lava flow or some other uh, large scale di disturbance that might uh, destroy a deep sea community. And we wanted to understand a bit about how long that process would take from start to finish. Obviously, the age of a coral, that's only one animal. But the community will likely take longer because you're requiring a lot more larvae to settle out. Um, there might be a pattern of community succession that takes place before the community is something dense and diverse like we've been seeing on the seamounts that we're surveying during this expedition. So my research showed us that um, you might see a decently dense community within maybe 150 years after a disturbance event, like a lava flow. But you won't see that really beautiful, um, large coral, high density uh, and diversity community like we've been seeing on these seamounts for upwards of a thousand years. That's really cool. Thanks. So the answer to the ABBA question is on and on and on. And not for the reason you think. Oh, like the blue water? No, no. It's just. <laughs> Like, it, the lyrics make sense, and I know everybody was thinking that I was going to say Waterloo, but that's not actually about water, so. <laughs> the 
Is there a way of mounting tracking units to shrimp or other deep water organically? Can you track? Do you track deep water animals yet? I don't think anybody's been able to track deep water animals like we would say um, a dolphin or a seal. Uh, no one's putting... other than like deep diving ones, right? Yeah, you like can... animals that are usually at shallow depths that can go like the beaked wheels, whale, wheels, whales. <laughs> And yeah, we can track those. Elephant seals and that kind of stuff. But we're not putting little trackers on uh, shrimp. deep sea crabs and shrimps mm -hmm. to see where they go. Can you imagine using trying to like use Herc to put a tiny, tiny tracker on a tiny, tiny shrimp? Well, I to mean, catch the shrimps. You, you the saw person. how it went when we were trying to just collect a crab. <laughs> now we we got the crab to take its backpack off. It would be another feet to just get it to put a different backpack on. <laughs> uh, but the only image that uh, my mind conjures there is, you know, like uh, you're trying to get a little kid like ready to go. It's like, okay, put the backpack on. No, I don't. No, you can't wear that backpack. You have to wear this backpack. Yeah, but you can't rationalize <laughs> with an animal while you're just shining light in its face and you're a giant robot. Just imagine how you'd feel. Giant robots like here, we need you to wear this tracker. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a little backpack. <laughs> like, shaped just like his own backpack, but, you but know. I'm, I'm just going to glue it onto your back so you don't let go of it. It just holds on to it. I feel like if we offered him another shell, he would have been like, thanks. Well, and even if we were able to put trackers on these animals, it would be another feat entirely to be able to actually track this deep in the ocean. Yeah. We would have to have some sort of local station, some some extra technology um, to be able to track a singular animal. So, question in the chat. Does this watch team have a name? I think I missed it. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, well, no, fortunately, we were your first blue water team uh, going in, beginning of this expedition, and we are your... Blue Water team going out, so our team name is Team Blue Water since day one. Yep. yep. We've gotten, I think, more Blue Water than any, any other, other watch. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't oh, even have to count. Oh, jelly. Hey. But, you know, what goes down must come up. Or go out. What? What? What goes down... Us go out to where? To the toilet. Oh well, yeah. That's one. What? That's one out. <laughs> I mean, technically, eventually, right? It goes into like the water system. I was talking about the RV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about life in general. This looks like an alien induction moment here. It's very dramatic. Yeah, this is a crazy view. That anything can happen in blue water. Anything. Oh, I mean, we saw that really nice jelly. Yeah. There might be more of those. I know... I was told the name of that jelly, and I know that I don't remember it. Uh, I call it a jellyfish. Yeah, but it's inverted. Like, you saw how the bell was sort of like when you put your contact lens in the wrong way. You know, I I used to be able to tell the difference, but now I've, 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 I've seen, like, if I flip it one way or the other, and they look the same now, so I don't know... Well, they're definitely know. different, at least for mine. Yeah, I mean, mine definitely used to be. I, maybe they still are. I'm sitting maybe here you're blinking. just so good now at like getting your contact right every time. Every single time. It's like years of experience. So many years. I've been blind for so long. Has this expedition been successful in terms of samples collected and sightseeing? Well, this expedition, the whole point was to see what was down here. So, yes, it's been extremely yeah. successful. Yeah. We were, we've had a lot of hours on bottom. I, I didn't do the calculation of all of our bottom time, but every single one of our dives was 
24 hours, 24 hours or, or longer. Mm -hmm. And our descent times are in the, what, two to three hour range. Yep. So that's a lot of time on bottom. Yeah, and we have 124 samples Woo. from this expedition. Yep, that's a lot of samples. It is. Oh, and a number of those will likely be new species that will be described. And new data on, you get some new information on water composition, bottom water composition in Barrowmanganese crests. And I'm looking forward to Coralie's papers. Uh -huh. Don't get too excited. Oh, congratulations, <laughs> Coralie, for finishing your final one. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not alive anymore. It's okay. I did I it, guys. I will try to pitch as few questions to you as possible, which no, is great because we're in the middle of the water. So what do you think of these rocks? <laughs> these rocks are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Why haven't we seen any seaweed? Well, seaweed is a plant. Yep, seaweed is a plant. We yep. are still really deep. There's no yeah. light down here for plants to feed off of. If we saw seaweed, uh, it would be very dead. <laughs> Yeah, um, so you need to be in the euphotic zone to do that, and the euphotic zone is the two first two hundred meters of ocean. So, so wait a minute. So when I ask you to describe rock formation, and you're just like, "Oh, it's a rock," but we're asking you. A, I didn't even ask you about ocean zones, and you're just right there with the All information. Right. Name the other zones. <laughs> Go. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, you guys should be celebrating. That That's was an awesome answer. <laughs> <laughs> Her brain just checked That's out. That's a great <laughs> question. Um, next question, please. <laughs> oh, I actually missed part of a question. Were there any wow moments? Yeah. Uh, oh. We saw an awesome acorn worm. We saw a spoon worm. That was like a total mystery buildup. Yoda. Yeah, yeah the Yoda. Um, the crab. The crab running away and then catching him. Yeah. yeah. That was great. Some of the rock formations and like... Yeah. Uh, the columnar joining. Coral gardens that we ran into. Oh, uh, super dense corals. Mm -hmm. uh, that was always my favorite part. That one rock. Except for when I go to annotate wild. it, then it can sometimes not be my favorite part. Cause <laughs> it takes a really long time. Yeah. It can be a little frustrating. But it's still great. Because it's gorgeous. Ooh, Coralie, yep. you, okay? you okay? Yeah. You ready to rock? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to read this question out and you interpret as you will. Lava flows on land often have lichen as pioneer species in primary succession, which helps break down the rock, uh, help break the rock down to soil. Do you know what are often the pioneer species following a deep sea lava flow? Wait, okay, read that again. Okay. <laughs> Lava flows on land often have lichen as pioneer species in primary succession, which help break the rock down to soil. Do you know what are often the pioneer species following a deep sea lava flow? Um, no. That sounds like a biology question. Yeah, yeah because I don't I know. think, yeah, I don't think I understand the question. Yeah. Well, I have a somewhat answer. Okay. So, one, uh, it depends on what depth you are. Uh, what kind of species you might see. I, at every depth, there's a slightly different community. So, you know, when you're really shallow, the community is going to be different compared to deeper. So if you're looking at, say, coral reefs off the big island of Hawaii um, in shallow water, your, your pioneer species are likely going to be your Parietes corals um, or Crustus coralline algae. Uh, you're not going to have the rock being broken down to soil because coral leaves research wouldn't work if uh, the rock broke down to soil. No. It gets covered with ferromanganese crusts. Um, but in shallow water, you'll see crustless coralline algae forming, uh, and then you'll have the colonization of corals and algae and other species. Yeah. Uh, in deeper water, uh, where my research was taking place, the pioneer species that I saw were the hemichoralliums, so those pink corals. We saw a number of them uh, on our dives, and they can grow shallower. So the we have a couple shallower water 
species of Corallium or Corallidae. Um, those are uh, Hemicorallium moense and uh, Plurocorallium secundum. So those were the pioneer species at depths of about 350 to 500 meters. Crushed it. Thank you. Okay, guys, got a comment from Aphrodita, right? Is that how you say her name? The SCF from the last cruise? Hello. Hey, thank you for the fun ocean exploration work you share with the entire world. Love to hear about everyone's passions. Really enjoyed seeing the more mature corals in this dive. By the way, I thought she was going to say the more mature people in this dive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a little yeah. yeah, with the uh, compared with the ones in the last cruise, which looked, quote, younger. Missing the big blue and the four to eight watch. Hi, everyone. Hi, Team Sponge from the last cruise. Trevor, Antonella, Aaron H, and Aaron R. Oh, she was awesome. Yeah, nice shout out, Afridita. Hope you're having fun back home. The school is out, so now she can fully watch the dives, which is sad because this is the last one for a little bit. Or well, second this, to last. Yeah, second to last one for a little bit. But there are always more dives. Another day, another dive. Yeah, and other organizations do have dives. Mm -hmm. I like to throw that out. So when we're in our off season, someone else might be in their on season. So I don't know if anybody's diving around the holidays. No idea. Probably not. Got a guest in here. What? No, Megan crushed that question. I know I'm on a spiel. Um, well, you can answer this question. Tell us uh, what to. Yep. What is the origin of the sediment on these seamounts? I know that's something that we are actively not sure about. So. What? Are you joining us for blue water? Yeah, I wanted to come in. I was feeling restless and. Oh. Excited that we had completed our, our dives on this. I can let everyone know who's listening how hard everybody works on making these dives happen. It's like a ton of work, and what a great team. We've got one more dive. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's like a half dive. It is. There's only half the ROVs. Right, and it's going to be pretty short. But, uh, yeah, so the question about... Where did the sediment come from? This is mostly comprised of the shells and, and tests of uh, animals living up above the seamount that have rained down. Some of it alters over time. Some of it might be bits of the lava that's around, but for the most part, it's biogenic in origin. Is that folks agree with that sounds good to me what kind of biogenic sediments do we have what kind uh <laughs> hemipelagic biogenic sediments i don't know what do you mean i don't know i just wanted you to say ooze ooze <laughs> yeah uh well, how do you know when sediment's good when it garners lots of ooze mm. i just made that up i like it that was a good one that wasn't too bad i won't put that in the trash okay all right Take it. Wait, you're not on, are you? Oh, you're okay. You're telling me secrets? Oh my god. I uh, actually don't talk to anyone unless it's through a microphone. And <laughs> why is the next dive Argus only? Um, so couple reasons. Uh, one, we want to grease the the cable. That's uh, it's always you know, a good thing to do. Yeah, at the end of a season, you know, you want to let out some cable, put some lubrication on it to protect it. And uh, two, we want to run through an iteration of how you do exploration with, uh, with that Argus vehicle, uh, basically observations and, and not sampling, but covering a, a lot of ground. Uh, and 
we won't really have time for a full iteration with uh, with Hercules before we have to start heading back to port. Yeah, the reason why I wasn't sure if what we were do I, I knew we were doing the dive, but I didn't know if it was going to be streamed or not. So, is it going to be streamed? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I didn't mention it before because I thought I don't know. Yeah, not my call, but maybe. Whoa, the phone's ringing. It's probably Allison. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, she's saying stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to hear us. She prefers to hear us talking. I don't, I don't know about that. That's the 808. I think they probably wanted to tell me that I could extend the warranty on my car. Oh, yeah, <laughs> or probably. Consolidate my credit card bills. Well, it awaits like the that. Honolulu number, and usually, like, they don't have any um, spam, spam calls. You don't get spam calls from local numbers. I don't. Oh. I only get spam calls from like random places on the mainland. Oh. Which is annoying because they call me at like 4 a.m. Oh yeah, right. Uh, I definitely get ones that white might, uh, that are from like wherever I am. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Oh, like I answer all of the 808 calls cause they're usually important. Okay. Well, we'll see if this person leaves a message. Yep. I can't connect to any of my voicemail messages because I, I'm not on data. I'm on Wi-Fi. Oh. So I'm I just going to have this pile of voicemail messages when I get back. That's I've weird. just called the people back instead. I've gotten some voicemail, so I don't know what. Oh, different. it says, hey, you have a voicemail. And I go to check and they say, but we're not going to show it to you, though. Oh, rude. Okay. <laughs> That's always fun. Um, are we letting the tow cable all the way out to 6,000 meters? I think we're going like 2,000 meters, right? Yeah, we'll see what, uh, what the weather looks like. There also isn't any 6,000 meter depth nearby. Yeah, that would Truth. be hard to do. Yeah. We could probably only go to 4,700. Yeah the deepest around here yeah no i have wi-fi calling on my phone are you having it's a conversation <laughs> with the people on the chat that's weird it's just not data I, I would not turn my dad off on in the middle of the ocean that seems unwise oh you should tell everyone how much uh, data storage we have we have okay so video and just straight up Data have two or two different beasts. What did he say? Was it fifty? It's fifty, 50 terabytes, terabytes just for the data. Yeah, and then like one to two petabytes for the uh, video. Yeah. That's the. That's not what we filled up on this cruise. That's no, that's the what storage we have. capacity. That's the capacity. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. Everybody, write that down. There's so the good to know. video data is the behemoth. Right. Yeah, it's, it's way massive. more than, than everything else. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just imagine if it was all 4K oh. or 8K. Oh. You could hold one video. Excruciating <laughs> detail. Five petabytes. Like a million petabytes. <laughs> You'd have to have so much more. And guess what? On my computer screen, it would look exactly the same. What is <laughs> <laughs> See, that's not true. <laughs> What is above a petabyte? What's bigger than a petabyte? I hope I never have to know. I'll, I'll look it up. Fine. Probably somebody's going to tell me in the chat before I have time to even type. I don't know how you guys look up stuff so fast. Some people just like know things. Give me the list. What's bigger than a petabyte? Uh, Ooh. An exabyte. Exabyte. A thousand times bigger than a petabyte. Yeah, and then a zettabyte. Sounds fun. Which is one million petabytes. And then a yottabyte. A yottabyte? Or a yottabyte, I don't know which one. Yottabyte. Oh, look, I got an 808 phone call. Same number? Zero, Are you zero, staying at a seven? hotel? No, you're not staying at a hotel. Oh, it ends. Uh, mine was... Don't call oh, I got a voicemail from it, too. Oh, I also got a phone call from... I didn't, but I wanted to be included. <laughs> uh, you will. It looks like they're like three minutes apart, so <laughs> we'll just get us all. If Megan gets one and I don't get one, I'm actually going to be really upset. Oh my gosh, they asked. Okay, 
so they ha they don't have red carpet for when I get off the boat. So they ask <laughs> what color. <laughs> what Should color be carpet. blue. Blue carpet. Great. Yeah, I'm gonna let them know. <laughs> <laughs> Do I know if it's all spinny drives or SSDS? I don't know. I didn't go down there. Well, I have been down there. I just didn't go in. They transfer to tape. They yeah. store on tape, so. Yeah. Lots of tapes. It's right behind the microfilm and the microfiche. We just fill like the hold of the boat with little tapes. No, no, no. <laughs> There's a whole data team that takes care of all of it, too. Yeah. Oh, well, bonus points to anybody who knows what a microfilm or a microfiche is, by the way. I remember for my graduate work, I did have to get one thing off of microfiche. It was the last nice. time I ever accessed. You know, it's you pull that tray out. And the glass lifts up, and then you stick the thing in, and the glass, oh, man. We, uh, as I was leaving my college, I, so I worked in the reference, or in the library in the reference section, and as we, were, I was leaving, they were going, working on discontinuing it because they had transferred everything to digital. Yeah. So they still had all the information, but they just didn't need the microfiche film. Yeah, they had all the information reader. that used to take up an entire room yeah. on, like, one hard drive. Yep. <laughs> Which like, mostly old... Mostly irrelevant newspapers, like just like I think the a lot of it newspapers. was, but uh, what I accessed was actually a very good paper. Yeah, it was a USGS open file report mm -hmm. from the Hawaiian Volcanoes Observatory by Ken Hahn, who uh, teaches at UH Hilo now and uh, did some seminal work on inflated lava flows, which are totally happening here, not here, but at mid ocean ridges. Uh, as well as on land. So the lava flow goes out really thin and then more lava is injected and it and it the top like lifts up. Oh, that's wild. And so if you like watched it in a time lapse, you would just see a lava flow come out and then the whole thing. <laughs> and there's a place up on, oh, do you go to the Big Island much? Mm -hmm. I've been. So uh, right where you turn up to go up Mauna Kea, mm -hmm. there's a parking lot across the road. And if you walk out there, you see these old rock walls and there's lava flow on both sides of them uh, at the same height, and the rock wall is below it. So the lava flow came out, and then it started to inflate, but it had cooled on either side of the wall, so it just grew up and left this nice hole where the wall is, and you can still see the top of the wall. Huh. That's cool. I just assumed that they had, like, dug it out. No. All right, what else are we talking about up here? I'm reading about microfilm and microfiche. <laughs> Not going to lie. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I had them straight. Yeah, the film was the one that was the roll, and the fiche was the one that was the flat one. Fiche. Microfiche. There's a pun in there somewhere about... Microfish? Small fish, yeah. Fiche? <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, they charged you? Our guest is departing. I'm just reading about microfiche and microfilm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
the question about the uh, why we're moving around the arms. Just as, as this is is this how Antonella practices manipulating the arm? No, no. I mean partially. Exercise the arms every so often. But it is good practice, especially it is, yeah. if it's your first time, like to learn how the arm actually moves, where it articulates, and uh, without having to worry about hitting the ground. So you just have to concentrate on the vehicle and where your arm is in space and looking at your cameras. They're going over different movements right now. Yeah, so. Nice. The arm can do lots of different things, and it's not always really intuitive of how, how it might move. And the arm is kind of heavy, too, so, you know, if you have, it can move the vehicle. If you're pushing against the ground or you get too far out, it could get stuck or react differently. There are, there, it's a lot more complicated than just uh, moving your arm. Definitely. But it's a really amazing tool. It's been engineered to just do exactly what you need. Um, and as technology advances, we'll have even uh, cooler tools. I know that people are working on developing uh, soft robotics to to pick up really fragile things um, really skilled manipulator operators can pick up fragile things um, with a claw but you know there are some things that it would just be better to pick up with like a soft robot squishy robot arms mm -hmm. For all you lovely people giving Trevor compliments in the chat, he's not the one who's <laughs> uh, moving the manipulator, so. Antonella.